Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corley from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Out cast for March 2024. It's already March, can you believe it? Um, as always, this is a Patreon-backed podcast, and I am your host, Adam Korlick, so thank you so much for joining us. If you are a Patreon backer, not only do you get early access to this and all my videos, but you can even uh, pick subjects, you can get shout-outs, or you can be on the podcast, such as our first guest, Joseph. Welcome back. Uh, hey, Adam. Thanks for having me back on. Well, thanks for always wanting to be here. I appreciate that because <laughs> somebody else isn't here. Uh, that's where we have to talk about Rob again. So uh, for those like four people who are Rob fans, um, yeah, he's unfortunately not available this month just because of our schedules like don't align. So yeah, that's that's unfortunate. Nothing wrong with him. He just sucks at scheduling stuff. Uh, so we're gonna have to move on without him. But uh, yeah, we'll just it'll just be you and I, Joseph, for now, and then later uh, Abdullah will join us. So alrighty. Uh, yeah. All right, well, you you say join us as if I'm still gonna be here but <laughs> well yes us as in the let's say the royal we almost okay. <laughs> <laughs> as as a collective okay um but yeah all right so the the first subject which was your subject uh you wanted to talk about was the whole situation with the switch yuzu emulator being shut down by nintendo yep. take point go nuts okay so to give just to give a brief recap here um so yuzu is a Basically, the mo was basically the most popular emulator for Nintendo Switch. It's been out for quite a few years, um, and Nintendo recently sued them to get it taken down. And Yuzu did actually take it down. They reached a settlement with Nintendo, so Yuzu is now officially off the internet in any of its official locations. This also took down the 3DS emulator Citra um, with it because you know, they were the same developers and. They basically had to dissolve their company that they created for it, which we'll be getting into in a bit. Um, so, yeah. So, a lot of people are now freaking out because they're like, oh no, is, uh, is, is Nintendo going to use this to try to kill emulation everywhere? And all that stuff. And um, it's, it's one of the more important things semi-related to like what this what your channel is about with, like, whole virtual games. I mean, obviously you do collection and you actually play, like, the regular games or use ODEs or stuff like that, so you don't really use emulators that often, but it's still... And, it, again, the Switch is a current system, but it was, I figured it was still probably something relevant that we should talk about on here. So oh, I completely agree. Because it's, it's about game preservation as well. Yeah. Now... Okay, so... Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so one major thing that we do need to, well, a couple of major things that need to be brought up about this that make that probably make this not as drastic of a end of game preservation scenario as it initially seems. So far, it's only been the emulator Yuzu that's been taken down. There are other Nintendo Switch emulators that exist that Nintendo hasn't sued yet, um, and even if they had gone after them by the time, you know, this goes live or, live or whatever. The Nintendo Switch is still Nintendo's current system. Like, if there's any emulator you can point to and say, and the pirate, it's being used for piracy and hurting sales, it, it is it is this one. Um, okay. So, it's not really the same situation as if, like, Nintendo going like, oh, we're going to gonna go ahead and kill this NES emulator. Or something like that. Like, Yuzu, especially when we go into more details now, like with set, like because Yuzu, the com the group, the developers, they had a Patreon account that was breaking in like thirty thousand dollars a month for development of the emulator, and they and basically a Nintendo's court case for 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 the reason of going after him, they were saying, yeah, Yuzu is promoting piracy. Here, we know that they're doing this because in the week and a half before Tears of the Kingdom launched, it was downloaded like a million times or whatever the number was. And Yuzu got a big up uptick in income because they were paywalling the latest versions of Yuzu with bug fixes or and that were able to, say, run Tears, Tears of the Kingdom behind their Patreon account. So, like... It, this isn't like a case of Nintendo just going after emulation because they hate emulation. Like, no, Yuzu was actually, in this case, was actually 
doing at least somewhat provable financial harm to Nintendo. Maybe not as much as Nintendo would like us to think, because, I mean, Tears of the Kingdom still, still so sold a ton of copies, but it's literally, it's legitimately there. Okay. See, that, so I, I have to admit, and I apologize to everybody, I only kind of got the cliff notes of this story. Just, and the, my reasoning isn't that, you know, I don't care about Nintendo or video games or whatever that craziness. It's because, like, I don't emulate stuff, so if I don't do it, I don't pay much attention to it. So I just kind of heard it when everybody else did. Um, but I, I, I essentially agree with this basic take. Like, if you're going to... I, I'm all for emulation. I want that to be very clear. I think that it's important as a, uh, a mechanism for g game preservation. Eff effectively, if systems or companies are going to abandon games and they essentially become abandonware... Not everybody's going to have access to, like, a PCFX to be able to play some of the games that are exclusive to the PCFX. Therefore, it's good to have alternatives for those who care about doing that. But, yeah, what they did is definitely at best shady. You know, specifically what you cited with the Patreon example. And so I can see that, first of all, being definitely how they were caught. And one, one thing with that that we've got to be very clear on is... Does did the company that produced this did they do it knowingly, nefariously, like whatever, screw Nintendo, we're just gonna circumvent them? Or was it like someone on their team was like, Well, we have to make sure that game works, so we'll just work on bug fixes. Oh, you know it'd be a good way to get some more money out of this, because we have to pay for development costs if you put that behind the paywall. And they just like, you know, they didn't think about the nefarious part of that. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like I'm yeah. trying to give them the benefit of the doubt that they were trying to do it for up and up reasons and yeah. the thing with this situation is it's very hard to talk about without without automatically having a bias against something somebody like nintendo or a company like nintendo because it does sound like they're effectively just trying to take away something people love which i understand but yeah. from their perspective if this is like actually impacting their bottom line it's not exactly a mystery why they would pursue it. And the only other example I can think of that's even like this in history was like when Sony went after Bleem. Yeah. Yeah, so for those who don't know the history of that and event... the other emulator at the time, that Connectix thing that was on Max, that happened around the same time too. See, you, I'm not familiar with that story. I can tell I'll tell the Bleem one. You can tell that one. So, like, it's not like only Nintendo does this. Like, Sony did do this to Bleem in uh, the late 90s. Um, basically, Rand Linden uh, was a guy, genius programmer, still around. He's, he occasionally chips into the community, by the way, from time to time. And he had basically figured out how to emulate PlayStation 1 games on PCs while the PS1 was relevant. Uh, and so that was kind of a big deal. But, you know, he wasn't doing anything illegal. And Sony kind of, in some ways, looked the other way because they didn't see PC gaming as that much of a threat. I know times have changed. Um, and at the same time, it didn't work perfectly. So they didn't, they just, I mean, they didn't like it, but they, they weren't as able to stop it. It wasn't until Rand Linden and Bleem decided to make Dreamcast versions called Bleemcast that ran better on the Dreamcast than they ran on the PS1. And that's when Sony got really scared about that because the Dreamcast, their, the system they were up against, being able to run their own games better didn't look good. Um, and so Sega official position was, we can't support this, but we're not going to stop you either. Kind of like the way they still do indies. Um, but Sony's position was like, this has to stop. Now in the case of Bleem, they went to court, I think four times and all four times, uh, Bleem was found innocent because they didn't actually break any laws. They were effectively shut down because of legal fees. Bleem was a small company, Sony was not. And the eventual settlement was that Bleem would agree to stop pursuing PlayStation emulation and Sony would cover all of Bleem's legal fees and that would be the end of it. Um, but to Bleem's credit, they never, not once, used anything that was actually an official Sony file. And in this case, like the, the point Rand Linden made, actually, he's like, so PlayStation games... All of them uh, have within it some, you know, basically like a boot file that is like a, a Sony-owned file. So we had to figure out a way to make the system, the, the games work without that particular file, 
which basically means that it could then read unsigned or burned copies. So, like, the official releases do Metal Gear Solid, Tekken 3, and Gran Turismo 2. You could actually use the Bleemcast release to run burned versions of that because it was actually legal as long as that Sony file in it wasn't actually there. Whereas if they had actually used, like, hey, we can make it so that the official disc only supports the official PS1 pressed copies, then they would have broken the law. It's that it's that kind of weird technicality. Yeah. And obviously, this 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 isn't about Bleem. That's just a little history lesson. But this is a similar situation, and I I, I think the lesson to be learned here is emulation is cool, but you you kind of do it after they the company's done making money on the system, because otherwise you're kind of going with a Pearl Harbor approach of just awakening the sleeping giant. Especially if you're like, charging money or you have like a way you're mon- monetizing it precisely like and especially nintendo like they go after youtubers for playing their games <laughs> like what were you thinking yeah exactly? like it, um, it's honestly a wonder why yuzu had I mean, well no i mean it, i guess it's really not so much of a wonder it's was probably that tears of the kingdom spike in patreon support yuzu got plus the known amount of piracy that game had that finally gave nintendo enough legal ammunition to be like okay we can finally go after these guys but because yeah. remember it, like the the, all the proof like you said with the bleem and also that connectix emulator from max that apple was gonna help w- like display it at like one of their trade events back in the day like the lawsuits against them with those basically are what define the, the fact that emulators are actually legal today it just so happens that in Bloom's case, they still ran out of money. And in Connectix's yes. t- case, Sony lost and was like, okay, screw it, we'll buy you guys. They bought it and then they killed the emulator because of course they did. Yeah. But, <laughs> like... Yeah, so motivations change. In the case of Nintendo, it's... Like, they haven't really cared much about emulation and stuff after the systems are no longer relevant, but they seem to be changing their tune now that they realize they can resell you stuff. Where would you say that started? Probably, like... I mean, they started reselling you stuff on the Wii, but I, I don't think they really cared all that much at the time. I would say it was like the rise of the eShop and stuff on the, the Wii U and the 3DS. Because I, I know that they had issues with those like R4 DS cards, but even that, like you couldn't really combat that too effectively. This yeah, because is... those were like, all those were set up by like shady companies and you kill one like, and then 12 others pop, clones of them pop up. Yeah. I mean, you can tell with the Switch that Nintendo really took the piracy side of it seriously. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I know we've talked about it before, but, like, the the way the certificates program works on Switch games and how each game has a unique certificate, meaning if you pirate a copy of it, the pirated copy is the same certificate across every single copy, meaning Nintendo will block that one. Which actually makes the resale market on used Switch games kind of dubious now. Because you could potentially be buying one that's been ROM dumped, and then you're effectively buying a game that's legit that will still get your system bricked, which is kind of insane. Um, did, did they actually brick the system, or did they brick the? Well, game? or at least they, they, more so, they. I'm being I'm being hyperbolic, but more so about okay. um, basically spam terminating your account, at least for online support. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah. yeah. Um. But my point was, effectively, you could buy a game that becomes a brick through no fault of your own. Uh, and Nintendo, it's, it's weird to see that them they're like the, the most hardcore against piracy now. Uh, whereas, I would argue for a long time, they really didn't care all that much, as long as you stayed out of their current territory. But, I mean, that's, that's where we're at now. And uh, I, I have very mixed feelings on the whole Yuzu thing, because, like, look... Again, it's really hard to have a case against an emulator that people clearly loved because of the ability to use it for free. That's that's obvious. And the games, like, I'm not certain, I don't pretend to know how people were getting game files for it. I can't assume there were too many legit use cases there, but I, maybe there were. You know, I, I don't know how that works. But I can see why Nintendo wouldn't like that. Um... But my my biggest case against it is 
the game preservation element of it because I I'm very much in the the camp the the camp of that obviously hence my support of physical but Nintendo Switch physical is ironically as it turns out very broken because of other reasons we just discussed meaning eventually yeah the only way to get a lot of those games may be like pirated digital ecosystem versions through things like Yuzu although I was just informed there's a new version of it coming up called Nuzu. Well, yeah, I mean, Yuzu was open source, so the fact right. the fact that the official GitHubs were were taken down were is basically like okay, yeah, so someone else who's downloaded the source code who's not part of the group can just fork it and make make some changes and re-upload it and it'll be back. Though, granted, if they're going as far as to call it Yuzu, that one will probably get sued immediately. Probably. But but I guess I'll ask you the question because you know you you're a smart guy, like. What is the motivation for making an emulator while the system is relevant if it's not financial? Is it just I want a challenge? Yeah, oh, almost, almost certainly. I mean, it originally, it probably originally started as someone who's like either with like software development experience who likes doing game stuff, being like, I want to try to do, I want to try to do this. This would be cool. Then starting with that, if if it's not financial. It's literally the challenge of actually trying to emulate a modern, modern, a modern system. Yeah, I mean, that's... All right, like, obviously, I, I'd never be able to do that in a million years. But, like, if I could program stuff, and I was like, dude, I, you know, just for devil's advocate reasons, argument's sake, um, if I was able to do that, and I just felt like it would be really cool to play the Switch on my PC and just prove to myself I could do it, I don't know if I would ever want to release it, because you're only releasing it essentially for the credit because you're also taking a massive risk with something like that which is obviously what happened i think the settlement was what like 2.3 million dollars or something yeah around that yeah and i i don't pretend to know if those guys can afford that you know that that sounds probably not insane. <laughs> yeah like even like, with you know, their thirty thousand dollars a month patreon account that they had that they had they probably which, don't have the funds to do that to which, cover that yeah they can't still have that Patreon account, obviously. Right. 30000 a month, that sounds amazing to all of us, but that's I'm sure they spent those funds. Oh, yeah, like, for that sure. Was, that was, like, the whole point. They have to eat. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if you're eating $30,000 a month, then you're really fat. But well, I mean, you, they're multiple people, but... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. But, um, but, yeah, so, like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't pretend to know how much individual liability any of them have or how many there even are, but... It, it kind of sounds like we're taking the side of Nintendo here. We're not. It's more like I can see why Nintendo did this, and and I don't entirely see why these guys would have made this other than street cred unless the motivation was financial. And if the motivation was financial, then unfortunately, I hate to be the bearer of bad news or the unpopular one here, then Nintendo had a legitimate case to stop this. Because if you're just effectively trying intentionally to steal their content and sell it for your own profit, that is theft. Mm -hmm. so i i would get that but if it was you know the nicest most legitimate of reasons it's just hey i wanted to challenge myself and put this out there then i would argue they might have just screwed up when they they made that whole tears of the kingdom debacle so and yeah yeah it does suck i mean the other thing though is like there will be another switch emulator it's just that this is going to slow everything oh no there there already is one like right it's called reuging it's been around it's been around even before yuzu Wow, right. I'm actually looking it up right now, and apparently they also have a Patreon. I don't know if they actually lock anything, any builds behind it, though. Let's see. They'd be really smart not to. Oh, yeah. Private supports, Patreon, if they mentioned. Mm -hmm. So Discussion. tell me about the other one, the Citrus one, the 3DS one. That one was a little more surprising. No, that that one is just that one's just a casualty of the fact that the user developers were the ones who made it. So when okay. Yuzu's team had to dissolve entirely, that just went with it because they had okay, to, that makes they had to take down their GitHub's and everything. Okay, that that makes sense then. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, so I, 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 in theory, Citra did not didn't do anything wrong that actually that we know of that would okay. cause Nintendo to go after them. Yeah, I know that Nintendo has been going after more and more ROM sites, although that's not news. They've been doing that for a while. Yeah. Really, like I said earlier, since they kind of figured out they could resell you NES games, like with the NES Classic. I mean, that's how far back we're talking here. 
that you know they've kind of taken more of a hard stance on that and it's it's it does kind of suck because like on the one hand it's nice that nintendo revisits their ip but on the other hand they are waking up to punishing other people for it yeah Uh, where you previously didn't care you know what i mean like the the fans basically carried the torch of certain games for decades that nintendo had considered abandoned uh and then suddenly they're basically being burned by said torch because nintendo suddenly cares um, yeah, I, 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 the last one I heard about the last ROM slit that they took down was also like making a ton of money off ads though yeah, yeah that's again that's where it gets iffy man because yeah, I, I, this is becoming like an existential discussion but it's like there are people like this who have legitimately good intentions okay we're going to I'm going to give the use you guys the benefit of the doubt that it's like you said they're probably just guys who thought this would be fun and a challenge and then they ran into the simple realities of living in a capitalist society which is like you have to pay bills for stuff and it's hard to define or dedicate a whole bunch of time to something like that when it can't generate any revenue. So they tried to find something kind of harmless to support it, meaning a Patreon or, in that case, ads on a website. But doing so, since they're likely not lawyers, that's when they realize, oops, that actually caused our problem. Yeah. You know and it's I mean? also, it, like, it also depends to the degree, too. Like, I, when I was looking up that other emulator just now, they're, like, making, like, 2000 a month, which... But they also aren't, like, paywalling any builds that can play games that the free version can't, either. Mm-hmm. So that, so if, so that might stop, that might stop Nintendo from bothering to go after them. Also, yeah, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. We do yeah. have a lawyer in my Discord, his name is Captain Potato, and he actually went over, uh, like, the case, and he basically said, like, uh, I'm just going to quote him. This case was bullshit. <laughs> he basically said, like, I can't believe that Nintendo won this, was more or less his, his legal position. Well, they didn't um, win it. Yuzu settled. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, that they, they even had to settle. Because, yeah. like, they shouldn't have been able to even be in that position. But that's where it kind of leads me into a thing of believing it was very similar to a Bleem case where they just couldn't defend themselves financially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that tells you how bad it had to be, where they were like, we'll settle at $2.3 million, which I probably couldn't afford anyway. Like, how bad were your legal fees? Mm, yeah. yeah. <sighs> anyway, to everyone listening, if you're into video games and you're thinking about getting into emulators, by all means, have some fun with it. Don't try to profit off of it. At least not until, like, truly no one cares about it anymore. Build your emulators, show your talent, and maybe you can start working for these companies and build them, you know, make money through actually working for them. Um, But, like, emulation in general, I want to be very clear. We both, I'm sure, both support this as, like, a concept. It's it's a good idea. I I mean, I've bought bought so many analog consoles at this point that, yeah, I mean, if I didn't, I would be a massive hypocrite. So, Mm -hmm. because despite what... They say and what people think about it after PGA consoles, that's still emulation. It's just emulate it's just written and functions differently. Yeah, it's on a hardware, hardware chip instead of software. Level. It's it, it's still an emulator, technically. Yeah, it's correct. It's hardware emulating other hardware rather than hardware emulating or software emulating hardware, which tends to work better. Um, but anyway, yeah, like we're in favor of it as a concept. It's more like I guess all we're trying to say is like be cautious about how you approach it. Uh, particularly with things that are relevant. Like, when it's irrelevant, nobody's going to care. That's why nobody goes after Cricks for EverDrives, because, like, why would you? Yeah, you know, that's, just, that's why yeah. Nintendo didn't go after the Wii U emulator. Mm-hmm. Well, they also dropped that system like a dirty shirt, but... yeah, well, I mean, yeah, yes, but that one also came out, like, a little while... That came out, like, after the Switch debuted as well, so it was like... Oh, okay, our Wii U is being emulated. Um, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much like, I don't care. Like, yeah, the, like the only thing they could have cared, Nintendo could have cared in that case is that it, it was a, it's a way to play Breath of the Wild on the PC, but... Yeah. I mean, besides that... probably that, wasn't <laughs> worth the effort. That probably wasn't worth the effort. I mean, you got to keep in mind, this is just kind of side story here, but by the time the Switch had launched... It had been like a year and a half since Nintendo had last done a firmware update to the Wii U. Like, and people were hacking the system and they just didn't care anymore. They eventually did one more 
system update just to try and make it a little more annoying, but that's now been bypassed, and Nintendo's truly done with that system. Yeah. So, like, they don't care. But uh, that's that's what I mean, though. Like, that's why you have to kind of wait till stuff isn't relevant. I mean, Nintendo's entire income now, if you think about it, is just the Nintendo Switch. They don't have their hands in the pie of any other thing. No. Nope. Yeah, like they don't even have a they have they don't do separate handhelds and consoles anymore. It's all the Switch. I, they obviously do some like arcade games and stuff in Japan, but that's like kind of it. Like everything just rides on the Nintendo Switch. So do they like, actually hey, we'll do the arcade costume. games, or are they just license the IP well, out to other people? That I can't say. That's probably a case by case basis. Okay. Um, but at the, but my point is like at best that's a side bit you know you make some money off of licensing Super Mario Brothers the movie you know like stuff like that but mm-hmm. let's keep it real like ninety eight percent of your income is coming from currently anyway the Nintendo Switch uh, and so it's not that shocking that they would be you know wanting to shut down something where people were basically bypassing their product I get that um, that's why it's theoretically good to diversify by the way but whatever. So, well, I guess our final thoughts on this, unless you have anything else to say. Well, I do have a few other things as well. Like, yeah, part of the bad. lawsuit case with Yuzu, like, they were also mentioning that Yuzu was also basically given instructions on how to bypass certain Nintendo stuff in order to actually get the decryption case you need to make the emulator work as well. So, that probably also didn't help them. But at the same time, I mean, they haven't managed to take down all the hacking sites, but. Yeah, at this point, it's just like, well, Yuzu's dead. We'll have 5,000 other clones by, like, next month. It'll be fine. Yeah, that part's definitely true. Like, (laughs) that's actually a good point, because you go, like, well, you look at this from Nintendo's perspective. Are they naive enough to think that shutting this down just, like, ends Switch emulation? Or are they just doing the scare tactic of, like, hey, you know what? If we do this, maybe less people will try or less people will try to charge money for a bill for builds of the thing that are specifically claim that specifically say yeah yeah pirated game that's not out yet works right but you you know what i mean like scare tactic is the goal yeah. i doubt the 2.3 million dollar settlement was the goal i'm sure they appreciate the money if they ever get it but that couldn't have been the reason they did this i think it was nah. more about a defensive measure against others at least for now when the next system drops, it's not too likely Nintendo will care about this for much longer after that. Uh, but we'll see, you know. Uh, do you have anything else to say on this? No, I think we covered it pretty well. I also didn't know yeah. about the lawyer in your Discord who had already talked about it. If I knew that, I would have looked over it. <laughs> Oh, no, he didn't, like, exactly offer, like, you know, a Supreme Court, you know, <laughs> like, okay, dissertation he just on it. He, he just was basically just like, said it was bullshit. He was basically like, why. yeah, this was, this was bullshit. Like, I, this doesn't make sense. Which is probably why you're right. They probably settled because their financial bills, were their legal bills were getting too high. And even if they could have theoretically won the case, it would have taken, like, more money than they could have factored in. Which tells you just something about how expensive legal bills can be, I guess. But I, I don't pretend to know that. I didn't exactly ask him to elaborate. Um, but okay, you know, there you go. I guess our final thought on it is like, we're obviously pro switch emulation. We do think that the situation sucks, but I will say that I at least get why Nintendo did it. I'm not saying I even agree with them on it, but I do get why they did it. There you go. Um, so we'll move on. Thank you, Joseph, for picking that. Uh, the next subject is from Spencer per year, who is of course a Patreon backer who gets to pick a subject. And he actually didn't really have one. (laughs) So he was like, yeah, just pick whatever you want. And, uh, so what we've done instead is that what we're going to do is talk about, uh, the PS5 pro possibly being a thing, which I, I know we had just talked about before we got on the call here. Um, but this time, I mean, this time it might actually be happening, but for like stupid reasons, and the only reason I'm bringing this up, man, is I don't really like rumor videos and like, oh, we're totally getting PS6 next week. Like, I hate stuff like that. Or, oh, so Xbox should... is going third third party. Yeah. I mean, occasionally you got to talk about it because something yeah. like that is momentous. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's, I use like, if I did a video every time there was like a PS5 Pro rumor or a Switch 2 or Switch Pro rumor. That like, would be your whole 50, channel. 
dude, 50% of the videos would be that. It would just be, like, awful. So, like, I only talk about it when I either think there's some credibility to it or if it's, like, truly some dramatically interesting reason. Now, this was interesting. Maybe not interesting enough to have its own dedicated video, but, like, within our discussion, I thought it was kind of cool. So, you no doubt have noticed, like I have... Um, a lot of people don't seem to really dig the PS5 as much as was anticipated. Like, you know, Sony had that whole thing earlier, uh, I think it was only a couple months ago, where they started basically saying, like, yeah, the PS5 is already basically entering the second half of its lifespan. Um, which I did do a video about, by the way, because I was like, well, yeah, it's been four years, which most people don't really take into account because you couldn't really get the thing to, like, last year, at least reliably. Yeah, because, you know, the pandemic and all that, you couldn't get it. People forget it. it launched in 2020. So it's like halfway at this point would mean an eight year lifespan. That's that's not unreasonable. Yeah, that, uh, that's as old as the switch is now, which honestly, Pretty it's still seven, baffling yeah. that Nintendo hasn't officially announced a switch too. But whatever, uh, we'll get it'll get there. But yeah, like you said, the switch just turned seven like a few days ago at the time I'm recording this. Um, so it's it's not totally shocking that sony would be like all right we're thinking about what to do next but where nintendo came through on a whole bunch of games that people were excited about mostly because their hardware was older and smaller and it actually predated the pandemic so a lot of people were able to get it well before any sort of shortage could have happened sony didn't have that luxury and they also didn't really make a whole lot of super exciting exclusive reasons to pick up a ps5 uh like last year was what spider-man 2 was like the big one yeah. And was there anything else of even note? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, Spider-Man 2 was the first time I turned up. Well, no, that, that's not true. I did play one of the Star Trek games that came out for a bit until it would, I realized it was all buggy and broken. It was like, well, I'm going to put this back down for a while. But that was because I didn't want to buy it on the Epic Game Store as opposed to buying it specifically because it was a PS5 thing. But like Spider-Man 2 was the first time I turned on my PS5 for a PS5 thing for actually playing a game in quite a while at that point. Like, yeah. And now, I mean, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth came out, so I've actually been playing my PS5 for the last week. But, I mean, I've is mostly been exclusive? doing stuff on the PC for the most part. Is that game a timed exclusive? Uh, yes, it's a timed exclusive for, like, maybe three or four months, and then at that point, I think it might be coming to PC. It's not like it's the first I think part it was on the like Xbox showcase, remake hasn't wasn't come it? to Xbox. Wasn't for, it on the Xbox showcase like a couple days ago? I could be wrong about that. I could swear that that was a thing. But, I didn't uh, see it. it. Doesn't I didn't matter. watch that one. So yeah, I, wouldn't know. I, I didn't watch it either. I just think somebody in my discord mentioned. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Point is like people are kind of disillusioned with, uh, let's say the excitement level of the PS five and the fact that it's really only delivered like a handful of games that you can call like legitimate, exclusive exciting playstation experiences in other words a reason to own a ps5 as opposed to anything else you can love nintendo hate nintendo for all the reasons we've already discussed but they do give you a reason to go to their system which is exclusive games made by them that are legitimately great that you can't get anywhere unless ironically you pirate them on pc of course uh through emulation so it kind of makes sense, you know, like that people are just kind of disillusioned with the PlayStation 5. And to be fair, the same thing applies to the Xbox. It's not like it's less guilty yeah. of it. It's just that people kind of, I'm not going to say they give them a pass. It's more like they're like, well, we've got Game Pass or whatever. I don't really care as much. That, you know that, I mean? that, 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 uh, that doesn't fly anymore. I mean, PlayStation Plus, Premium, whatever is the same thing. Well, almost, well, not the same thing because like, the new games don't go on it immediately. But they have that too, like... Okay. The only difference See, is that Microsoft occasionally, like uh, not occasionally, like puts their first party stuff on there. So when, for whatever reason, I mean, I don't know if it actually has worked for them at all at or at this point, or if it's just been like really bad. But we'll see. Yeah, like I know they're going to put the new Call of Duty up on Game Pass like immediately and everything. So it's like, but then again, they own Activision, so they can do that. But mm -hmm. basically, my point is, it's not. Not like Microsoft is offering you a lot more excitement. It's just that people feel, for some reason, less jaded about it. Although, it's not like they're not jaded. I see plenty of people complaining that the whole generation sucks because it's basically not that exciting. Because every game is like available on everything. And therefore, there's no reason to have any one particular platform. Which, 
there's an argument for and against that, which is not the point of this particular subject. But basically, and we're, we're, we're kind of taking a long time to get to the point here, I suppose. But supposedly, Sony's next big move here uh, on the PlayStation 5, if you were to believe the rumors, is the idea is they're going to create a PS5 Pro for a few different reasons. One, to just kind of have a more definitive hardware edge so that they can be like, hey, the experience is going to be better on PlayStation, blah, 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 blah. That's That we get. Um, and a, on top of that, it's to give them something else to market that will get people possibly more excited about the system. Um, because admittedly, like, new hardware is interesting. You know, it's something you want to see, like, what can it do? I'm, you know, I'm curious. What kind of special things is it able to achieve that the previous version could not? Um, and it's fun to talk about and make videos about, etc. So it gives them a product to get people excited about. But third, and if you believe this story, uh, part of their big motivation behind this is that when GTA 6 hits consoles, they want it to be like associated with the PS5 Pro and be like, look, why would you get this on anything other than a PS5? Look how amazing it does on PS5. Clearly the Xbox version sucks. It obviously isn't going to run on the Switch. You got to get a PS5 Pro for GTA 6. If you are a console gamer, obviously PC gamers would be exempt from all this. But like that's the argument being made. And let's entertain the idea that that actually has legs and that that's true. That might be one of the stupidest reasons to ever release something like this. Uh, yeah. Because, but you know... <laughs> the, the, if any developer has some plot to make Sony go, okay, yeah, we need to give you a stronger thing to make your game better, it would be Rockstar. Let's be, let's oh, be honest. Oh, definitely. <laughs> you know, I, I agree. I'm just, like, if it's Rockstar and GTA 6, like, it wouldn't even, That's the one game, I actually agree... That would be the one game where, like, Sony or Microsoft be like, we need to build a new console just for that game. Because, I mean, it's been, what, 12 years since GTA V? I think it came out in 20. Yeah, it came out on the PS3 originally. Yeah, yeah, 2012, I think it was. Um, and that game is not only the most successful game, like, ever produced. I think it hit that benchmark, like, the year it came out. Um, but it still sells like crazy and it still makes tons and tons of money and it's hit three separate generations with constant upgrades and just, it never seems to lose any traction. So it's not shocking a, that they took forever to make a new one, but B that, you know, like Sony might want to be involved and be associated with that. That actually does make sense. But from just the PlayStation side of that argument, it's completely different than any other time we've ever seen an updated system. And those pro models, if you want to think of them that as that, is very uncommon. Like, Nintendo's done it debatably twice. So, some people would argue three times, I would say twice. Um, the new 3DS over the 3DS had an extra hardware in it to make it more capable and, you know, run some extra games for it. The DSi, a lot of people like to point out because it had... I thought it just had an extra camera. It turns out it has, like, extra RAM and stuff in it that, apparently, that makes it able to run games that only could work on it and not a stock DS. Yeah, actually, all two of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that, that's Unfortunately, that's actually what defines this. You know? That's true. <laughs> um, uh, you can sort of argue the Game Boy Color. I wouldn't, but the Game Boy Color is a weird one because, like, Nintendo put it out kind of like a pro system and then later kind of decided that it was its own thing and it wasn't a pro system, um, which is, like, the opposite of what happened to, like, say, the Super Graphics, where NEC put it out to replace the PC Engine and then it wasn't doing very well, so they basically treated it like, no, no, that was just like a temporary pro version. We're going back to the normal one. So, like, it, it happens. Um, obviously, Microsoft did it with the Xbox One X. And that's, that's like, and Sony themselves did it with the PS4 Pro. Like, it's, the reasons you do it are usually because, at least the last time we saw any major reason for it, was that, was the PS4 Pro and Xbox Series X, or uh, Xbox One X, excuse me, were both trying to upgrade what was considered an anemic outdated generation the day it started like yeah. do you remember that like when the oh, xbox yeah. one and the ps4 launched they were already considered vastly out of date uh and it was like why why do this so but that's like, not the case with the ps5 like i'm not going to sit here and say it's still cutting edge technology 
but it's it's not the same case where everybody's like man this thing sucks it just chugs it's so out of date like game developers are constantly complaining like i see that argument with the switch and logic well, yeah because so. that's seven years old <laughs> exactly it's a handheld <laughs> and it was out of date when it came out but by design Right. But I don't see people saying that about the PS5 or the Xbox Series X. Like they that that isn't the reason you do this. So you can't argue that the market conditions are really there for a PS5 Pro. Okay, so we have to detach that. Uh the 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 separate reason, like I said that they want to do this again would just be give them something exciting to talk about, which is actually equally depressing because it means they don't have any games to go with it. They have nothing. And if you've been following the news about all these, like, development teams getting fired lately, I'm sure you've Mm -hmm. seen it, all these layoffs, we are reaching a cusp point where the industry is, it's beautiful that it's so big, but games now take so long to develop and they take so many resources and so many people that it's just so ridiculously expensive. If anything goes wrong with anything in that process, like if the game fails for any reason, tons of people are out of a job. Yeah, it's that's why the Final Fantasy VII remake games have that console exclusivity thing because the amount of money Square Enix had to burn to make those work is just ludicrous. Exactly, and then a lot of people that caught the the normal routine there is to fire a lot of these people to try and balance their book sheets, and it's just like, wow, okay, so what that tells me is they now have actually less resources or theoretically would have less. I don't actually remember Sony being responsible for firing a bunch of people, but I could definitely be wrong about that. The thing is there were so many companies like within the last two weeks that just fired a ton of employees. I don't even remember the label. Like Um, there, there's a, I mean, and to be fair, like it's not even just video games, like in the tech sector, like they layoffs have been happening for like a year now. Exactly. And so the point is, that kind of tells me they don't actually have a game. They don't have a Spider-Man 2 this year, it sounds like. They don't actually have something to tee up as, like, the reason you need a PS5 this holiday season. So if the rumors are to be believed that they're intending to drop this thing this year, funny enough, that would actually track with the only other time they did this. When they released the PS4 Pro, they did it relatively shortly after the PS4 Slim, but granted it was a shorter gap. I think that was only like two months. This would be about a year. Um, it does make me wonder if Microsoft cares to do that or not. Apparently, if you remember that uh, that weird like 22-minute like interview they did addressing all this stuff about them possibly quitting consoles, they did straight up say they're working on new hardware, but that's kind of all they really said. And we've, we've seen a leak, a leak of their of yeah, hardware Brooklyn. they had too. So the, the funny thing about Project Brooklyn is that at this point... It's like two years old. Oh, uh, be- yeah, that's because right. Because the e- the we first of all we heard that story like a year ago, and then when we first heard about it, they were like these emails were written like a year prior to that. So Project Brooklyn may never even exist. Like it it, it could be like the Sega Pluto of the Xbox universe, where there's like two made and they're just sitting in some some place. Yeah, somewhere. they could they could have been just like okay, making an Xbox Series X that's digital only makes no sense, and we'd have to retool everything. Yeah. Because, like, I don't know what the other advantage... Eh, that doesn't matter. That's not the point of the subject. But, so then finally you have to attach the PS5 Pro to this whole thing about GTA 6. And I, even though I still think that's baffling, it also is probably not that illogical that they would think that that makes sense. Because it, it's a bet. It's a gamble to be like, look, we're going to make an entirely new machine just for this one game, but I have to be honest, if there's any one game that could actually make it work, it probably would be GTA 6. Yeah. The question is, did Rockstar sign up for this plan, or is this just Sony kind of hoping that that'll work out? I, I mean, if if Sony would be making the P- PS5 Pro specifically because of GTA 6, Rockstar would have had to be at least involved in talks about it even if they didn't go exclusive like okay we're making this system come out ex- specifically to make your game better or whatever you have to make sure you hit the date <laughs> you, you can't delay the game 
So right, and that that part I get, but like, why would Rockstar really care? Unless there's some financial attachment. Like what I'm saying is, would Rockstar be like, yes, we're gonna tweet out about how PS5 Pro is like the way to use GTA 6, or we're gonna bundle it, like you know, or all that stuff, like where they just marry the game to that particular hardware, or is it just like, yeah, we agree, it it runs better. <laughs> like, you yeah, know, like, I, like I can't really imagine it. the scenario where Sony's like GTA Six is coming out. We need a better PlayStation Five to make it the best system that's available to play it. I could I could see Rockstar going to like Sony and Microsoft and be like, yeah, so uh, your consoles aren't strong enough to do what we want to do. Are you making a pro version? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's the, see the thing is, guys, we're obviously speculating. All this is based on rumors, so I'm just like we're trying to get in their heads. Because when you say it out loud, you realize, like, some of this stuff is really stupid. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so it is a good question. Like, who approached who or did anyone approach anyone? And if any of it's true, like, this is how it would have had to have gone, which is a little weird, I guess. But I don't know. Like, I guess I'll ask. Are you enough of it? Let's just say this is all true. Like, this is completely true, 100%. It's coming out in, like, September. There's going to be a PS5 Pro or maybe November, you know, around the holidays, whatever it is. And we know it's basically there to be the GTA 6 machine when that comes out. Which, by the way, the release date on that would be very wrong then, because GTA 6 comes out in 2025. But, whatever. Whatever. Um, Yeah, exactly. But, assuming there's any validity to any of that, like, is that enough? Would you be like, alright, I better get one, because I love GTA 6 enough. Yeah, see, I don't. That wouldn't motivate well, me personally. Well, there there are two reasons why. One, like like I said, I've barely played my PS Five in the last couple of years. Two, I've I haven't really played the GTA games all that much, if at all. Yeah. So I, exactly, I don't care. <laughs> right. So I guess it's fair to say we're not the core demographic. No. <laughs> but but at the same time, like I don't know, man. Like I just I. Like, I wouldn't be opposed to getting a PS5 Pro in concept just because it's literally me and I own, like, a PCFX and a well, Casio Loopy and, like, whatever. I'll, I'll get all the stupid things. I don't care. Like, and it, I'm sure it would be the best version of the PS5. I don't have any doubts of that. But, like, I can't imagine there's much of a reason to get it, like, as far as, like, the games themselves. Like, I'm sure various Sony-based games, you know, like God of, God of War and stuff like that would have your, like, PS4 Pro or PS5 Pro patch that makes it run better. But, like, would GTA 6 being, like, this definitive game for that machine be enough for me? No, that wouldn't motivate me. I'm sure I would marry the two at some point, but that wouldn't be my reason to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I never got a PS4 Pro because I didn't. Well, A, because when it came out, I didn't really have the money. And then when I would have had the money, it was just like, didn't really see the point because all the PS4 still played every single game. Yeah. And that's that that could be the same use case. But it is weird. I will tell you this, though. Like, based on YouTube comments and obviously every time one of these stories blows up, like, there is some demand there for a PS5 Pro. But I don't know if it's just, like, the Twitterati yelling the loudest. Like, is the... Is the people who are asking for a PS5 Pro doing so because they legitimately think the system is anemic, it needs updates, and that that would improve things? Or is it just, like, the same group that was like, yeah, we'll totally support Morbius, you know, the movie that failed spectacularly, and it's Morbin time. I don't know if anybody even remembers this whole thing from, like, whatever it was a year ago or two. Is it the same group, or is it just, like, is Sony looking at PS5 Pro constantly trending, and they're like, well, maybe we should build one? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure, like, for people who are, like, co- exclusive console gamers, I mean, possible. Well, then again, that, that includes you, and you're not <laughs> yeah, motivated for it yet. But um, I could definitely see, like, people who don't have, like, a gaming PC being like, well, okay, it's been four or five years. I mean, I'm sure a new machine that's not quite a new next-gen machine, but that's better will be better. Like, yeah. It, it's it's the same mindset that some people go with up, upgrading their PC graphics card every like two years, which honestly is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I upgraded my graphics card to my PC like after like four years, and I did like a sizable jump. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Which is the same. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's the same argument with consoles. It's why like I'm not really a big fan of the whole like 
half step upgrade thing because i mean again there's not that many examples of it in history but i will tell you this and you guys should all know it the xbox series x completely rendered the xbox one x superfluous totally pointless aside from the connect games which really doesn't do anything for me and then the ps5 rendered the ps4 pro completely pointless again for except for like i think like 12 games for some reason they couldn't get working yeah like like that's when, it. when the ps5 came out and i got it like my first impression of it like after playing a couple of the ps5 exclusive games that you know i also got were well then again i think i was just the demon souls remake at the time because miles morales was also on ps4 um but i was like Okay, yeah, this is this is probably the best PS4 Pro I could have bought at the time. Yeah, th- I think my review of the PS5 was that it was the best PS4 I'd ever had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I think that's what I said when I first got it. It was like, that's all it felt like was a PS5. The PS5 was just the ultimate PS4 Pro. Um, and that's, and unfortunately, that hasn't really changed much. Like, I mean, again, we're kind of plateau- the- plateaued on graphics. I mean, sure, you could make graphics better, but... We're getting to the point where, like, if you, like, use more polygons or whatever, it's not going to look as drastic as, like, it, as, like, previous gens did. Like, you're never going to have something that goes from, like, um, SNES to N64 to GameCube to Wii U, Wii U again. Like, yeah, all of those were adjustments. noticeable upgrades. Yeah. Like, things will always get slightly better, but, yeah, diminishing returns. But the argument I was going to make is that it seems like... We're hitting the logical extreme wall of exclusives because for forever people have always hated exclusives as a concept because it's a fundamentally a thing that requires you to have two extra like an extra machine you otherwise wouldn't want. Right. So people don't like it because they're like, I can only afford one and I don't like that. I have to get two to get be able to get this other thing. But I've always made the case that exclusives drive the industry to be interesting. Like, I will cite all the way back to, like, the Sega Genesis versus the Super Nintendo. There were very few games that were actually on both systems. And even when they were, they were usually pretty different. Um, Because sometimes they'd be straight up made by totally different developers. Like, Aladdin is a perfect example of that. The SNES version is made by Capcom. The Genesis version was made by Sega. Obviously, sports games, you know, will be similar. But that's just an example. Saying that exclusives made the system worth having and it made it worth discussing now that everything is kind of hey we're trying to share everything the the thing you lose in that is that you're when you're arguing about what's the difference between a ps5 and an xbox series x like why do i like this company over that company you're mostly arguing about like what the system looks like what the controller feels like and like some of their corporate policies and when that's the stuff you have to debate, it's no wonder we're all like kind of less passionate about the games being put out on that particular system. Yeah. Because like I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to play Far Cry Six. I guess I can pick it on literally anything that isn't the Switch because it's on all of them. It's not exclusive to anything, so it makes no difference what I choose. Yeah. Like honestly, when was the last time like anyone like seriously like really had any of the console war talk type talk? I mean, I'm sure people still do it, but it's it's very different. But then again, that also my point is also highlighted by Spider-Man 2. The only reason that game got the kind of attention that it got is because it actually was an exclusive to that system, aside from what would eventually be a PC version, I guess. Well, but it's, it's like, not out yet on PC. Yeah, so. but, but to be but to be fair, they are doing it apparently. So that said, that's why people cared. If, if that game was like, let's, I know Sony essentially had that game developed in house, um, but let's say for argument's sake that they didn't and it was available on Xbox. Would I, I'm sure the game would have been like well reviewed, people would have bought it, but it wouldn't have had the same kind of attention to it because the reason people cared is because it was different, because it was a unique thing. And I think that that's something that we're very much losing in video games. And you know, I, I, you know, as much as we were kind of crapping on Nintendo earlier, you do kind of have to somewhat pay respects to them for the fact that they are like, we're going to do our own thing, which means we're not getting all the exclusive, we're not getting all the ports. We're not going to get them. We know that. Our hardware can't do it. But you're going to be able to have a totally different experience on a Nintendo Switch than you are on other platforms. Yeah, and even, even then with the Switch, like for a couple of years, they were getting all the ports. I mean, they're yeah. not as good, but 
at the time they were also the only way you can play them portably. Correct. Yeah, that and it's I saw somebody make a point about this like years ago. I think it was when The Witcher 3 dropped onto the Switch and it was like people were just making fun of like how bad it runs compared to like, you know, the the more modern console versions. And it's like, yeah, that's obviously true, but you now can play that game portably where you never could before. And it was like back in the day if you were the guy who hung on to the Sega Genesis or Super Nintendo into the next generation, like you didn't, you couldn't afford to do it. They were still making like watered down versions of those games available to you that you could play, at least be able to like be somewhat in the loop socially on it now. And that was considered a positive. Now the same logic is suddenly insulting and everybody's like, you're an idiot. If you play the, the, the Witcher on, you know, the switch, at least that's the argument it was a few years ago. I don't know. I'm just, I guess yeah. I'm a jaded old man who's just saying I've noticed a substantial paradigm shift in the way people look at the philosophy of video game releases. Well, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, there's also something to keep in mind too. Like, like obviously, like w- when the PS like three was out was like right when you and I were finally adults. Dude, um, I I got it the year after I graduated high school. I'm a few uh, years away from being 40 now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, flies. what? Like, maybe a year younger than you, possibly. Yeah. If that. What, 36? You're 36? Yep. Yeah, I'm 37. So, basically, you would have graduated high school around the time the system launched. Probably 2006, right? Yeah. Like, I was in my first year of college when it... There well, you go. first year of college the first time, but then, you know, stuff happened, and then I had to wait, like, about years before i could go back but Oof. but I'm, I'm guessing you graduated high school in like the spring or early summer of 2006 right so only a few months later the ps3 came out now look at look at where you are <laughs> time has gone by man it father time waits for none of us but uh but yeah that said we are also talking about gta launching on the ps3 as well so there you go granted it was a tail end game for that system. oh yeah like the PS3 generation, like, that one last, like, the 7th gen, that lasted for a long time because of all the stuff that happened with that 2007 recession that lasted for ever and screwed everything up. Like, imagine if, like, if that hadn't happened and, like, game, what generation, we would be, like, at least on, like, gen, like, or we're on, we'd probably on be nine. approaching gen 11 if, like, that's a possibility. We'd at least be in 10, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that depends. Like, you know, we don't know what other external factors would have caused something like that to happen. I mean, but yeah, right. that generation was unreasonably long, and it was just because of the economics. Like, people weren't exactly excited. Because, really, new systems should have launched in, like, 2010, maybe 2009 in the case of Microsoft. But they obviously were like, we can't do that. Like, nobody's going to buy that right now. So they held on to them for like four years longer than they should have. But where they screwed up was that when they finally did do them, they were really conservative in the technology. Because, like, even before they launched, everyone knew the Xbox One and PS4 were underpowered. So it was like a weird yeah. transition. Because, like, you go from one console to the other, it's like, yes, it's definitely an upgrade. Because but it feels like the upgrade like, we would have gotten had in things been where normally. Yeah, we would have got that update in 2010, not 2013. That three years does make a pretty significant difference when your average generation is only four years. But yeah. anyway, um, at least that's what us old guys were used to. Now I'm like, you know, I make these videos and I see these, usually a lot of younger kids are like, well, you know, that makes sense. Consoles are supposed to be around for like eight, ten years. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not how it used to be. And I, I guess there's an argument that that's good, but it also does create this problem where you're just like, the technology can't keep up with the, like the, in the system, can't keep up with game development. Um, which these different complication factors does lead to potential problems. Uh, people always talk about a crash. It's not impossible, but definitely things are changing, I guess I would say. Yeah. Um, so I will leave it with this because we talked about the PS3 and let's go out with some sort of interesting little note. Are you aware that only like two weeks ago, Sony put out a new update for the PS3? I was not. My yeah, PS3 is not hooked up right now, so yeah, I haven't turned it on in a while. Yeah, so apparently it only addressed two things. Uh, one, logically so, it's just got you know more 
steps in it to complicate hacking the system because they can never just leave that alone. It's mm-hmm. like, dude, really? <laughs> like, it's it's been almost twenty years. Please stop. Um, the reason that sucks is even if your system is hacked, uh, it and you have like uh, like using like PS3 Hen or something like that, the system still connects online so now it starts recognizing there's a system update waiting so stuff gets a little gimped until you do the update which means you have to get a hacked update which takes time anyway um but the other thing they apparently added is that blu-ray has been around since 2006 and the format has changed quite a bit and the ps3 was no longer able to run certain modern blu-rays so they had to actually update certain things in it so they could keep up to date with blu-ray support Oh, wow. Which I actually give them credit for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, because well, I guess if people bought the well, I don't know how many people actually bought the PS3 as a Blu-ray player. Because it wasn't like the PS, it wasn't like the PS2 where like a lot of people just bought it because it could play DVDs, and then it's like, ooh, now I have a game console. Yeah, that was what they were clearly going for with that oh, thing, yeah. and it failed spectacularly in that regard. Um, I don't blame Sony for trying that though. Like, but they, they pulled that attempt too many times. Like, oh, the PSP will put out these UMDs and then everybody will watch movies portably. Like, they were just hoping that whatever format they created would just be as powerful and successful as DVD. Imagine if they had stuck to that logic. How annoying it would be every time a new game console came out. We were just expected to all upgrade our libraries of films. Granted, this is pre-streaming, but yeah, yeah. And I think the irony is, does even though Sony is like directly involved in the creation of Blu-ray and 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray, doesn't the PS5 not support it? I know the PS4 doesn't. No, the PS5 does. PS5 does. Okay, because I, I believe, always find that funny that the PS4 that would, that would have been not. that would have been ridiculous if they didn't support. Let me see. PS5. The, well, the PS4 Pro and the HD. see the the reason I bring that up is that the PS4 and the PS4 Pro do not. Meanwhile, the Xbox One S does. The Xbox One S from, like, 2015. <laughs> yeah. The Xbox One X does. Yeah, that, that was weird. It was, especially because it's their format. So that means that Microsoft was paying Sony for every unit sold, so good for Sony on that one. But why they didn't value the format enough to put it in their own damn machine, I have no idea. But anyway, that's whatever. All I'm trying to say is that, yeah, there's an update out there for your PS3. If your PS3 is hacked, maybe wait for the hacked version of the update before you try doing that. Uh, and, yeah, apparently it'll have some new Blu-ray features, though. I don't really use my PS3 to watch Blu-rays anymore, but occasionally it comes in, in handy, you know, because, whatever, I do like my Blu-rays. But, um, yeah, any I, other thoughts? Right on now, I, I'm honestly, like, my PS5 has more... Well, I haven't really been watching many Blu-rays either, but... My PS5, it also was like 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 last year was used more as a Blu-ray player than as a game console. So believe me, believe me, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, if you have no other thoughts on this, then I guess we'll just move on. Yeah, I'm good to go. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me. I'm just going to do a round of shout outs here. Uh, So the following people are all Patreon backers that are at the tier in which they get a shout out, with one special exception. But I'll get to that uh, first. We've got Loke. Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, Trey Wagner, and very temporarily we are giving a shout out here to a guy named Lodmot who is in my Discord. He is a Patreon backer, but he's not normally at the shout out tier. But for whatever reason, I don't know if he got drunk or whatever, like a couple days ago he just like sent me some money over PayPal. Uh, so I just thought I'd fair give him a shout. So thank you for doing that. Um, so huge shout out once again to Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, Trey Wagner, and Lodmot. So if any time, if you guys are out there, if you want to support the podcast, as you can tell, we unfortunately lost Tim Inman. If you're still listening, dude, hope to see you back someday. Either way, thank you so much for the support. And if anybody out there wants to support the podcast, again, get shout outs, pick subjects, potentially be on here, or just get early access and support the channel. I appreciate that. All the information's in the description. So Joseph, as always, thank you for joining me. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and move on to the next section. Thank you for having me. Hey, we're back. Okay, and this time, Abdullah has returned. Welcome back, Abdullah. Hi, happy to be back. Um, so you got a subject, but we're going to save that one for last. We'll, we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. I think you'll like it, since I picked it for you, because <laughs> that's how that goes, but I think you like it all the same. It's about Nintendo. I know I know you love your Nintendo. Um, yes. Okay, and also, sorry that Rob's not here. He sucks. Uh, what can I tell you? <laughs> um, okay, so we have a, a subject from a backer whose name is Sinjeet. And uh, 
basically we kind of have like two subjects in one here. First, I don't know if you're aware, but the PlayStation 2, uh, the highest selling video game console ever, mm -hmm. just turned 24 like a couple days ago at the time of this recording. First mm -hmm. of all, how old does that make you feel? Well, let's just say I'm almost that age, so. Yeah. I'm older than that way. So, um, so, so it kind of, also it's a console I grew up with. So kind of takes you back that I uh, remember a time when that was the modern one. So that's what was modern. Exactly. Yeah. So when it turns 25, I might do like a whole video, but I thought it was just kind of worth acknowledging. Maybe we go down memory lane here for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wanted to kind of, take that and all these video games like we might be talking about and then kind of I, I don't know like i want to talk about some potential video game franchises that could have been turned into movies maybe ones from the playstation 2 uh and just kind of or like maybe alterations of movies that came out about video games from that era because the ps2 era was a very weird era where like you know the fusion of that and movies where we started like animating entire characters like as movies like if you, have you ever see the matrix sequels so, like, in the Matrix sequels, for example, like, they completely did a full human CGI of Neo, and, like, we were meant to believe it, but it looked like a PS2 game, or, like, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, where he looks entirely like a PS2 game. So, I just kind of want us to get back into that early aughts mindset. Let's go back in time a little bit, talk a little bit about the PlayStation 2, and then maybe each come up with some sort of video game from that era that would be cool to make a movie out of. Would you like to to lead on this? What have you got about the PS2? What can you tell me? Uh, so I, I think I mentioned this before in uh, another podcast, uh, an older podcast uh, to you. So the concept of the Nintendo that was common in uh, North America, for example, the, the Nintendo was not really the actual Nintendo, but it would just be what a video game is, right? Yeah, a generic term like Kleenex for tissues. Yeah, so, yes, exactly. So that's what the PlayStation was here, and specifically the PS2 and PS1. So even the GameCube was PlayStation. So, right, I got so you. It was very popular. Yeah, it was very popular here. Almost everybody I knew had three, at least. And whether they got one and broke it, and it was so easy to, to find it. It was very common, obviously. I mean, uh, this is not something new, but it was very common here. However, I was one of the weird ones who actually liked the GameCube and the Xbox right after. So PS2 was kind of my last choice when it came to that generation. And as a Sonic gamer, so, uh, Sonic fan, <laughs> what what? So, but back then I, I didn't really understand. A lot of the history and things like that but, but all i heard was the ps2 was the dreamcast killer and so i had held a grudge against that console i said <laughs> i'm not gonna play that anymore <laughs> because i, I love sonic and you do the math uh, th that was my perspective on it but eventually i got you because it was the easier one to find and it was the games were easier to find and there was a time when there were stores here that would sell you uh burnt games but uh, all of them got caught eventually <laughs> but parents that time they didn't know what it was they just knew that hey this is a cheaper console and the games are cheaper whatever that game was so because it was easier to access i was kind of i had to play it you, you kind of get me mm -hmm. everyone i knew around me everybody got introduced to gaming through this console in my generation at least yeah, this is the console that they started the gaming adventure on. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah, perspective because, like, obviously I'm an American, so we kind of got spoiled by having game consoles around for a lot longer. But in a lot of other countries, it's like a lot of you guys were basically introduced either through something like the PS1, the PS2, or in some countries' cases, like the Famicom, and that was like it. So yeah, it's it's interesting to see. Yeah, it was here. Like that, I'm, Famicom. Yeah, yeah, it was it was here. Some people were. But most of the current generation here, PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, definitely. That was the start. Yeah. And then they would it even call sense. it the Sony. I can imagine at the height of the PlayStation 2 that piracy in your area must have just been astronomical. Oh, it uh, was. It which was. Is, I guess until, you're confirming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was, com it was common. And this is, I think, this is the, 
I'm almost confident this is the reason why it's so common and well known here. Probably everybody's nostalgic with it because of mm -hmm. that. That was very common until eventually they got caught, and you know that's no longer the case. That doesn't entirely shock me. I mean, the PS2 people forget that system technically was around until like 2014. I think its last yeah. release was uh, Pro Evolution Soccer 2014, which only came out in yes. Europe, I think. But the uh, point is, it, it did last a monstrously long time. Well, thank you for that story, because that, that was a perspective I wasn't expecting, and that was actually pretty fascinating. Uh -huh. um, for mine, oh, okay. like, you know, I've... You know, I've talked about the PlayStation 2 a lot in the past, and you know, I remember when it was setting up. And when, by the way, when we're talking about the 24-year date, we are talking about the fact that it launched in Japan. I think it was March 4th, um, uh, 2000, mm. and and then it came out here later. Uh, I want to say, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I want to say in like November of uh 2000 as well but either way uh, um the point is i remember that whole anticipation of that launch and it was it was kind of insane and like how hard that system was to find like i actually managed to get a launch unit um but famously there was like nothing to play for that system when it first came out there was very few games available for it so the reason you were using it was more so as a dvd player um, which was brand new technology at the time and was awesome. And of course, if you had a PS1, you could play all your games. I remember, I actually remember um, this one time. So it was, it was like early 2001. So like the Christmas season had come out, like nobody had PS2s because you couldn't find them. I actually had one and a buddy of mine was like, Hey, can we all just like, you know, can you, everybody come, kind of stay at my house and uh, Adam, you can bring your PS2 and we can play it. And I'm like, sure, but like we don't have any PS2 games. But I brought it anyway. We're all just playing the PS1 with like, I don't know if you guys remember this, but like the PS2 had this feature where it could like buff out PS1 games a little bit to make them look a little better and stuff. And all of us were like, oh, I can see it. This is next gen. <laughs> like, even though it barely does anything. And you're sitting there looking at it and composite like on a CRT and stuff. But like, that's just one of those like kids moments that were fun. But, uh, I, I've said this before in the past. I think my favorite game on the PlayStation 2 that's truly like unique to that system uh, is probably Twisted Metal Black. I think that's the one I spent the most time with and I had the most passion for, the most fun with. And I would have said that could have made a fun movie, but we got that Peacock series and now I'm less confident in that answer. But I do think that had we had some kind of goofy Twisted Metal movie in like 2002... It might have been one of like the funniest bad movies ever made, and I like an Uwe Boll like type of movie or something. What I would love to see is a crash. I agree. Movie. I I don't think there is a crash movie, right? I don't think there's a Crash Bandicoot movie. I think no, the problem is no. that there's very few. I mean, if you really want to talk movies for a second, from an industry standpoint, um, it's really hard to get video game movies made for a variety of factors. Most video games don't actually lend themselves narratively to the formula of a film. Like, we might yeah, think they sure. do because they've got a bunch of cutscenes, but that's that's not actually enough of a film structure because, you, you know, you're trying to hold the narrative together with actual gameplay, and it's that doesn't work. A lot of video games are basically... Let me walk to the place to get the thing, to go to the place to get the thing, to do the thing. Like, that doesn't make yes. an interesting movie. Um, yeah, and if uh, you don't believe me, just... If you don't believe me on that logic, just watch Star Wars Rise of Skywalker. That whole movie is, I've got to go to the thing to get the thing to get the thing to get the thing. That is a video game movie. <laughs> like, in a literal sense, Star Wars Rise yeah. of Skywalker. So, it's more fun when you're playing it. It's not fun when you have to watch other people do it. Um, what, the other element similar to... That, to the shock anybody uh, i i i think you're you're not into pokemon right uh, but uh what i would say no, is that's no. similar yeah similar to the shock i got when i was introduced to pokemon in the anime as an anime and they mm -hmm. started playing the video games it's a shock of the difference yeah. so usually i started as a video game yes but but then when you you can see the point you're making here right so it, it narratively it's an, so what happens in the video game is very difficult to translate into an anime, and vice versa. Precisely. It, not too many or, characters and storylines can correctly cross. And even fewer are marketable. Like, Sonic only worked because it was literally the most popular character Sega has ever or will ever have, in all probability. And it mm -hmm. still, even then, its movie is very standard and predictable not bad by any means but it's a very formulaic 
standard type of movie. They it's just the fish out of water type of movie. You know, we've seen that plot line a million times, but it works for that character. Mm -hmm. I saw the second one, but I don't remember it. And I, I guess there's a third one coming. But um, I guess my mm -hmm. point is, I still believe fervently that there will be a video game movie renaissance, kind of the way the comic book movie industry had a renaissance when X Men hit Avengers. back in like 2000. Yeah. Uh, well, Avengers was eventual. I mean, the movie that transformed everything was oh, Brian okay. Singer's X Men. I think in 1999, that that movie changed it from, hey, you know, comic book movies are silly like Batman and Robin with you know Arnold Schwarzenegger, mm -hmm. into this is going to be a, a new standard accepted thing in film. And I know there's exceptions before that. Obviously, Batman '89, Richard Donner's Superman, but those were th very rare. It wasn't like Richard Donner no, Superman about a, was so sort of. Renaissance kind of situation. Yes, I'm talking about a renaissance mm -hmm. in which, like, rather than the video game movies be the occasional one that's okay and most of them are bad or goofy, we're going to get to a point, probably, where video game movies are a big thing that happen on the regular. We just haven't got it there yet because nobody has made the equivalency Maybe of a Brian Singer X. Sonic and, Sonic and Mario started it now, but I, maybe it just needs more time, I guess. Yeah, the Mario but, one's an interesting case because mm, people obviously really liked that. But it the, the problem it has is that it's a specific type of animated film, which is always going to limit it because that means anything wants to coexist with it, it has to be the same type of animation. And it also means it has to be animation. Like if the Iron Man movie with Robert Downey Jr. had been an animated film, there is no chance the MCU turned into what it did. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I get your point. I get your point. Yeah. yeah uh, anyway, that's just nothing. me going off on movies now. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, let, yeah. that's yeah. Right, we're, so. we're we're going off subject here. But uh, so yeah, it was PS2, really interesting. Happy see, birthday! Yeah. yeah, happy birthday to the PlayStation Two, and uh, thank you, Sinjeet, for that subject. Now, Abdullah, we're going to move on to your particular yes. subject, which you did not pick, but I knew you'd love it. Okay, are you ready? We're going to talk GameCube. Yes, I, I was thinking about when he sent me the subject. It was interesting because I'm I recently got back to playing a few of the games I actually just cleared Sunshine again. Good. But let me let me yeah. tell the audience what the subject is though, and then we'll go off about it. So yep. um this is ironic actually because uh this is the type of subject Sinjeet usually likes, like alternate history, but I thought this would work the other way around. Um so the basic premise is what if the GameCube had won? And let me set that up and we'll explain what I mean by that. So in the um, in the sixth generation of video game consoles, you have technically five systems. The new one, which basically did nothing. The Dreamcast, as much as I love it, did bow out early. Then you have the GameCube, the Xbox, and of course the PlayStation 2. Now the PS2 won that generation hand over fist. Sega and obviously VM Labs did not continue to make consoles. Microsoft decided to do the more traditional route of make like a next gen machine. Hence, we get the Xbox 360 eventually. But that's where Nintendo changed. Uh, you can make the case that Nintendo stopped trying to make competitive hardware in after the GameCube. Hence, the Wii. The Wii was originally yeah. meant to just be an add-on for the GameCube, and then they decided to essentially rebundle it in one machine and call it their next system when it really was just the GameCube with on steroids. And ever since then, Nintendo hardware has been like a generation behind. It has worked in the case of the Wii and the Switch. It did not work, at least from a financial perspective, in the case of the Wii U. I guess where I'm going with this is, let's imagine an alternate universe where the GameCube... I don't know if it actually beat the PlayStation 2, which which does sound ridiculous because I think the GameCube sold like 24 million units or something, and the PlayStation 2 sold like 155 million. It's not even close. Um, but let's just, for argument's sake, let's say that like, you know, the PlayStation 2 sold 100 million, the Xbox sold 100 million, and the GameCube sold 100 million. Let's just balance it out, all right? If that had happened, if Nintendo had been competitive, or even if they had somehow technically won it, what do you think would have happened to them after that? Well, can I uh, maybe start off with that? Because yeah, but yeah, I want you to lead the way, man. I still feel that they would have still experimented with like the, maybe the motion control of the Wii, that that idea, but it would still be pretty much you're you're gonna get 
it's gonna follow the same road as the PlayStation and uh, Xbox uh, in terms of okay. trying to win with the power of the system, not trying to get a unique angle as it did with the Wii. So in in some sense, you might say that despite me loving the GameCube, it not being successful kind of gives Nintendo an interesting edge currently that they may have not realized and except because they uh, didn't have as much success with the GameCube. That, that's what I think might have happened. Well, I agree with you because like, it's, it's undeniable that since the GameCube, the two of the three systems they've created, and I'm not including handhelds in this, uh, the Switch and the Wii have been like 100 million plus unit sellers. It was the Wii U that failed. But ironically, mm -hmm. I think what you're trying to say is had, and correct me if I'm wrong, of course, had mm -hmm. the GameCube done this, there wouldn't have been a Wii the way we know it. Obviously, we both agree on that. They yes. probably would have done equivalency of the Wii U, but back in like 2006. Yeah, something like that, where, where, where they, they would put more effort into the power of the system. Because uh, GameCube was when they stopped because uh, they didn't work out so well. I mean, it's an amazing console. Right. Uh, so I guess what I'm sure. asking you is, like, you, I agree with you. They probably would have tried something unique like motion controls. So if we want to just kind of envision the Wii U as coming out in 2006, set aside there probably would have been various technical reasons that would have been a pain. The gamepad itself may not have been possible. I don't think tablets were super popular yet, if I remember correctly. Um, certainly that type of smartphone was not, so I don't, I don't think that would have been the same. But they probably would have tried to do... Imagine the Wii U without the gamepad but with Wii Motes. I think that's along the lines of where we would have been. Now, the question is, would that have been a hit? Um, I don't know. I think part of what made the Wii a hit was the fact that it, it was only like, what was it, 200 bucks when it came out? It, it, yeah, was, it was not it was that cheaper. expensive. Yeah, like I think the Xbox 360 was like, yeah, I think the 360 was like 300 or 400 dollars, and the PS3 famously when it launched was like 600 bucks. So yeah, I think that part I of why the Wii worked, yeah, I think part of why the Wii worked because it was such a cheap alternative. So I mean that was smart on Nintendo's part. I'll give them that. But like again, imagining that they would have essentially launched the Wii U in 2006. May, 250 well, 300 bucks it, it, i don't know man like i part of me wants to see that track of history where nintendo is still like hardware relevant where developers can still make stuff for them where they're making beefier things but at the same time i look at their own history of success and i'm like eh, i can't deny that these people know how to make money <laughs> you know? oh um, they do definitely they do cuz the the thing is one trend that has been true of nintendo possibly for their entire history like if i really sit here and i think about it is developers always have a tendency to say nintendo your hardware isn't powerful enough please upgrade it and they don't really care like even the nes you know they were like this is a great machine but like the sega master system can you know outperform it uh for various reasons but they nintendo didn't care they wouldn't adjust accordingly they dragged their feet into the super nintendo which was probably their highlight as far as that kind of thing, I, I don't think developers really gave them too much crap over that. N64, they did not like the whole cartridge approach. GameCube, I think they were satisfied with the tech, other than the mini discs, because that uh, created data restrictions. And then, of course, after that, we, we know the trajectory. So, and again, I'm not including handhelds in this, but um, it does make me wonder, like, would Nintendo have even really cared? I mean, obviously they didn't, but, like, would having the wii u equivalency in 2006 how much would that have satisfied developers and would it have made a difference because it seems like correct me if i'm wrong you're a big nintendo guy in almost all cases a nintendo hardware the games everyone seems to remember the best are the ones that nintendo made themselves right yes i was gonna get to that point yeah yeah, so you, you take over, that. because I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know how much it even would have mattered. In terms of games, I think it would still trend towards the same way. I, I think that would, be, that would be the case, and you would still see... It would pretty much follow a similar pattern as PS4... Uh, sorry, PlayStation and uh, Xbox, 
But I still mm -hmm. think that Nintendo would still experiment like they did with the Wii. But they did have they did think about the power of the system as well because it's well that they've been doing that until the GameCube. But I think something like the Switch may not happen. May not happen. No. Uh, I actually agree with you. Well, this, I don't think it would. Yes, because the the Switch kind of is a result of uh, an accumulation of uh, the lack of success when it came to the GameCube and Wii U together. So, mm -hmm. forced Nintendo into really... It's, the concept of the Switch is amazing. Uh, actually, So, perhaps it's their failure that the, the failure of those systems overall kind of made them shift. It made Nintendo think that the um, the way to be successful is through innovation. So, yes, the point I wanted to make is that maybe if they, if they kept focus, focusing on power, they would eventually have to be normalized, much like this other system. So that I think it, Nintendo would lose being so unique. Basically, what you're saying is they would have continued with that GameCube model, where the system was on par, games for it were very good, it could have had third third-party support, but it would have been entirely reliant on its game library, not Netflix or DVD support or Blu-ray support. I assume that's basically what you're saying. Yeah, because eventually everybody will catch on to things that if they can do it, they'll do it. But what will be right. intended unique would purely be its play on, on its nostalgia factor. The Mario's so let me ask you this. Right. Let me, let yeah. me ask you this. So video games, as weird as it sounds, video games uh, from a marketing perspective where you have different console companies competing with each other. Their competition is almost like baseball in the sense that uh, you win when you're talented, but you're also really hoping the other side screws up. Yes. Like literally baseball tracks that they have a, a stat called errors and errors is how a lot of and even runs and points are earned in baseball. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so even, I, I, even I look soccer at it, too. I'm, I'm going to say this, right. Similar so to I'm soccer, gonna say you same, want the other team to commit a foul or something. Precisely. So yes, exactly, exactly. So when I look at, uh, like, just to give you some, I mean, you guys know your history and I'm sure you do too, but let's just to refresh your course for everybody. It's, it's hard to deny that a lot of video game companies failed, not because they were knocked out by superior alternatives, which is definitely true in some cases, but a lot of them just made stupid decisions. Like my beloved Sega made a hundred hardware decisions that were just boneheaded to say the least that really kind of knocked out their resources. So um, every company does this. And so what I'm wondering is, and the version of history that we got uh, Microsoft made the Xbox 360, which was a powerful system for its time that was easy to develop for, and they did everything they could to try and appeal to third-party developers and get them on board. Sony, in that same timeline of the PlayStation 3, was so confident in the PlayStation brand because they had known nothing but juggernaut success. You know, the PS1, over 100 million units. PS2, 155, still the highest-selling system. So the, And PS2, one of its underhanded tricks is that they had made it so hard to develop for that if the system was a success which it was it meant that developers would not have the resources to be able to develop games other than for the playstation 2 because it would take too much work to convert their games away from playstation 2 coding into something that the xbox or the gamecube could use unless they just had adequate finances for that so point is you would prioritize the playstation 2 and if it got a port to anything else that was just lucky so they tried that with the PS3, and that's where they fell on their face, because a lot of developers are like, nobody's buying the system, it's too expensive, and it's a pain in the ass to develop for, and if we try to develop for it, we can't, it's just not worth it. The Wii was easy to develop for because it was the GameCube, but it was underpowered, So, and it also couldn't do certain things, like sports games were dead in the water on that system. Mature games, dead in the water on that system because of its nature. So I guess what I, where I'm going with all this is, had Nintendo basically made the Wii U equivalency, and I say that only in terms of power, in 2006, whatever it was, and it was easier for developers to make it, how much damage do you think that would have done to the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360? The ports, like the, the games that were multi-plat, nobody really made the Wii versions for the 360 or the PS3. There was no reason to. They were totally different games. Yeah, Sonic Unleashed, for example, comes to mind. Sonic Unleashed. 
he right. Gonna come so, when, when, when they, right. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. So what I guess I'm saying is, if the we let's call, let's call it for argument's sake, let's call it the we knew just for our joke purposes, because I don't know what else to call this fictional machine. The we yeah. knew, um, it's it's relatively easy to develop for. Uh, it's right off the back of the GameCube, so presumably it would have had GameCube backwards compatibility. I guess we could throw that out there. Um, mm. But now developers would not have had to make separate Wii edition games. So they would have had more resources for other things. So does that end up prioritizing the Wii New over something like the PS3? Or does it make them go, oh, I would, great, we have more resources so we can do it for everybody? Yeah. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I, I would guess so. But, uh, but I also have to note that you still have to also consider uh, the PS3 and Xbox uh, 360 by themselves may have had a different, uh, may have been developed differently with the success of the game because the, with, with the, that with the is success. yes because yeah that's extremely case, good assuming, yeah so so I, I the first thing i thought about was it would definitely be a success because or at least it would be second place it will definitely not be the worst because when you think about that generation the first thing that comes to mind is when when i remember the ps3 the price point and plus the difficulty you mentioned it makes it very bad and Nintendo, you think about Nintendo, and it's like, this is Nintendo, everybody loves it. It has it, it, lots of support. Why don't we get our games there? They'll get their Marios, and then they'd look for other games from, their same, from the same system. And it, and it has enough power, so let's let's go in there. So you'd think maybe in, it, Sony or Microsoft would have probably changed their strategy, because they're going to say, well, we're going to have Nintendo, who has been a success ever since, and had a successful GameCube system, and uh, their game, the last generation would be the GameCube, and that was a success. They have enough power. They got the, uh, you know, their own first-party games. There's a lot of demand for their systems. Developers would tend mm -hmm. to say, okay, I would rather have my games on that because I'm guessing they'll sell more units, and therefore I'll sell more games. With the right. So it may have changed the way PS3 and uh, 360 was, but if it was... If they were developed in the same way they did, I think it would probably edge out the PS3, make the PS3's life way worse. Because if you think about it, if it was for those, you know, powerful games that developers would have a rough time taking them to the Wii, you essentially have two options, either a PS3 or the 360. But if you got three, it kind of make it even worse on the PS3. Yeah. And actually, yeah, you, but, you know, you kind of make an yeah. interesting point there sort of as, as you were talking i was thinking about this um you said something that made me think of this um because we were talking about the ps2 earlier and developers were so people forget this man people were so against developing for the ps3 because of how hard it was but the ps2 was still stupid popular and obviously as we talked about earlier it stuck around a lot longer so there were a lot of games being made for the playstation 2 over the playstation 3 and they were usually getting wii versions or the PS2 version was yes. brought over to the Wii in some version. So exactly, like, Sonic and Wii uh, really comes to mind. Right. Yeah. So there's a there's obviously a lot of X factors to this, but I will say as this this conversation is obviously you know very much a speculation fantasy what if scenario. But this one is fascinating mm -hmm. because I think it actually might have given me a bit of a mental paradigm shift because I used to be of the mindset like I really wish Nintendo would just make competitive hardware, and this conversation has made me think. You know what? They were probably smart not to do that. Like, it's annoying, sure, that, like, the Switch, you know, feels... Like, even when it came out, it felt like it was 10 years out of date. But that was kind of the genius of it, is that, you know, as you as an end user, you're still getting a fun gaming experience. But for them, financially, it was genius. And it has allowed so much content to be produced for it. Um and yes. the only uh, there's many reasons why I think the Wii U didn't work out in the same way, but it really should have um, if they had just paper, made a couple of tweaks here and there. Yeah. On, so on that's paper, yeah. yeah I, I don't know, man. I'm starting to think, and it, as we sit here and we look at all this, new, all, I'm sure you've noticed all the headlines lately about all these studios mm -hmm. like firing tons of employees. They're mostly doing yeah, it because gaming has gotten too big, and um, I mean that's if gaming has gotten too big or where. The industry has gotten too big to the point where if a game fails, like half the people are out of a job. Whereas Nintendo seems to be the least guilty of this because they're kind of doing everything within budgetary reason. 
So they, they might weather the storm better than anybody else. That's interesting to think about. But, you know, they did competitive hardware effectively three times in a row, and the only time it worked was the Super Nintendo. Like, the N64 wasn't a flop, but it didn't do as well as people remember it doing. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, those in North America in particular, we tend to think of the N64 as being, like, a staple, but it actually really underperformed. Uh, it actually yeah, lost to out the to the Sega Saturn. In Japan, anyway. Yeah, the PS1 slaughtered it. It wasn't even close. Um, and, in fact, its its yeah. failure was so significant, coupled with Sega's failure, that it allowed their greatest rival of all time, Sony, to rise out of basically nothing and dominate over both of them. Um, and that, that, that couldn't be ignored. Uh, so and that, then, of course, the GameCube, as great as it is, it, I think it actually lost out to the Xbox, which is insane considering that was Microsoft's first system and really was only relevant in one continent. Um, yeah, not so, much. yeah, I could see why they needed to change. Anyway, alternate history is kind of fun. We should probably do that more. But uh, for now, uh, I think that that will do it. Uh, so, uh, Abdullah, thank you so much as always for supporting and no joining problem. us here. I appreciate Happy that. To be here. Uh, Happy to be. Thank you. Uh, for uh, earlier for the subject, Sinjeet, thank you very much. Also, shout outs to patrons. We've got Lo- Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, Trey Wagner, and Lodmot, as well as earlier for having Joseph on, as always, and Spencer Perrier for his subject. So thank you to them. Thank you to everybody who listens to this, all the Patreon backers especially. Always appreciate the support. Don't forget, you can sign up for this and all my videos, get early access and support the channel, etc. at any time on Patreon. The links are in the description. And speaking of that, if you guys could do me a favor, like the video, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't done that before. For. Tell us your thoughts on all this stuff, as well as check out all the social media stuff in the description. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, obviously, Spreadshirt, my travel channel. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you all later.